moving on then, um, the main reason why you're here is for our guest here. This is Dr. Kingsley Said. Um, he is a lecturer in computer science at the University of Sussex, which uh, for those of you that have been to a few of our other lectures will know they've been one of our kind of key partners with presenting these over the last couple of weeks. Um, so Kingsley's going to be discussing his course um, and obviously topics around computer science that might help you and see if you're interested in that subject area, taking it forward. As always, if you have any questions for Kingsley or for any of us here, we've also got Lillian, who's um, uh, from the admissions department at um, Sussex as well, who will also be able to help with some technical questions if they come up. Um, please pop them in the chat. So just pop them in the chat there and we'll be able to ask, we'll have a Q&A at the end after Kingsley's finished talking and we'll be able to pop them in then. So now I'm going to hand over to Kingsley. Kingsley, would you like to take over and tell us a bit about your course at Sussex and computer science? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody is fine today and welcome to the University of Sussex here, just outside Brighton in the United Kingdom. Uh, so thank you very much, Joseph, for that introduction. Um, I'm a senior lecturer here in our Department of Informatics. Uh, informatics is just, well, a fancy word meaning computer science. So I'm a senior lecturer here within the Department of Informatics, and that in turn sits within our School of Engineering and Informatics. So I'm sitting here talking to you uh, from my office uh, here at the university. So what I really want to try to do today is I want to say a little bit about computer science, and I want to say a little bit about what makes it exciting to study computer science, and in particular, to give you guys some kinds of ideas about what it's actually like to study computer science here at the University of Sussex. So if you have any questions, please do uh, let us know, put them in the chat feed as we go along, and we will attempt to deal with as many of those uh, as we actually can. So what I'm going to do here is I've got a little bit of a presentation, and I'm going to start off by telling a little bit about computer science, what makes it exciting, and why I think you would enjoy studying computer science here at the university. So let me just put my uh, correct screen on here. Okay, now with a bit of luck, everybody can see my screen. Let's just yeah, we can indeed, Kingsley. Thank you. You can see my presentation. Good. Thank you very much for the confirmation. So, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about informatics. Now, first of all, let's just uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the word, when you're looking at computer science degrees, sometimes you'll find the word computer science, and sometimes you'll find the word informatics. It does mean the same thing. Informatics is basically the study of information science, the study of computer science. Okay, so why should students be interested in computing? That's a question I get asked a lot. Why should I study computing? Why not study business or why not study engineering? Why should I study computing? And the answer to that really, in my opinion, is because computing is all around us. It's become a hugely integral part of our world. Whether it's the, the smartphones and the laptops that we depend on in our modern lives to organize our lives and to communicate with each other, whether it's the systems that control our houses and our homes, we increasingly have network and internet connected devices in our homes that control everything from the climate in our homes, the lighting in our homes, or indeed the future, the thing that's still to come the future of self-driving or autonomous vehicles, or whether it's the way in which we enjoy ourselves, the entertainment systems that we have. All of these things rely on developments in computing. And that means that computing has become a phenomenally important part of our modern lives. And that makes it worth our study because the world requires experts in computing. We live in this exciting and constantly changing world. The way that the world has changed in just the last 10 years is staggering. The way it's changed in the last 30 years since I was an undergraduate is truly amazing. Computing devices are absolutely everywhere. We carry them in our pockets, we carry them on our wrist. They're absolutely everywhere. And there's huge numbers of new devices I look around my home and I now find we've got computers and everything from the refrigerator to the washing machine to the television. They're absolutely around us. It's become hugely important. 
we are rapidly becoming a digital world. And we need to make sure that we can be effective citizens in that digital world. So what actually is this thing called informatics? Sometimes people will use the word informatics and sometimes people will use the word computer science. Well, if you look informatics up in the dictionary, there's probably a definition that will tell you the study of the storage, the transformation and communication of information. It's really all about information. And a lot of what computer science is about is about how we deal with information in an effective way. For example, the words that we write or the images that we capture. We are now all used to being able to use our phones to take images and record our lives and document our lives and put things on social media. So huge amounts of things about the images that we use and process, that's all about information management. It's computer science that sits behind it. Or indeed, every time we listen to our favorite music, that's information being processed. That information is being stored in a digital format on our machine. So this idea of information science, the way we use and produce and use information, this idea of informatics sits at the heart of our modern ideas of what computer science is all about. And that means that a computing degree is a very, very useful thing if you wish to take that full kind of role, have that full kind of engagement in this modern computing world and be a part of how that world, of how that revolution is actually coming about. Many people talk about a new industrial revolution, an industrial revolution of data, where machines are turning out data all of the time, our cameras are turning out data, sensors, huge amounts of different kinds of data. And it's a really, truly global phenomenon. And that means that if we want to be part of the workforce, this modern workforce behind and driving this industrial revolution of data, then a computer science degree really is a way to achieve that. You only have to look at some of these figures to realize how much of a revolution this is. Look at some of these kinds of figures. Strange terms like zettabytes and yottabytes. Suffice to say, the amount of global internet traffic is growing hugely. Just to give you an idea, we have terabytes, and then terabytes have become petabytes, and petabytes have become exabytes, and we're rapidly heading towards a world where the amount of data that we have around us is now going to be in the yottabyte type of capacity. We may even have to start inventing some new words as the amount of data gets bigger and bigger. And that's really important stuff. Look at some of these figures to help us understand just how much data we're producing every day. I did a little bit of research and we discovered that 5.5 billion Google searches are being made a day. So about 306 billion email messages are being sent every day. And I think at least half of them seem to be for me. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but look at that. About 80% of them are just rubbish. They're just not interesting. Google themselves, they're estimated to use something like 15 billion kilowatts of electricity a year. That's more than some countries. It's incredible. And of course, the number of devices connected to the internet. In 2018, something like 21 billion devices connected to the internet. That's something like three devices for every person on the planet, doubling at an alarming rate. And in 2018, there was more internet traffic than all previous internet years combined. This is a huge growth industry, and this makes it important. So I'm trying to impress upon you the idea that computer science will help you be a part of this forefront of this industrial revolution of data, an exciting place to be, an exciting place to study, an exciting place to develop a career. But of course, you could study computer science, you could study informatics at many places across the world. So why should you want to study it here at the University of Sussex? Well, this is just one rather nice image here, which just shows something of our campus. It's a very attractive campus here on the south coast of the UK, very near the city of Brighton. It's a modern campus with lots of really modern facilities, high quality computing facilities, and we have been over the years through many extensive renovations and rebuilds, and we've added considerably to our facilities. And that means what we have now 
is a really modern and uh, high quality and very pleasant kind of environment to live and to learn in. And you can study lots of different things. There are lots of different flavors of degree program that you can opt to pursue here at the university. For example, you can go for what you might call a, a straight computer science, BSc, and we also have a four year flavor of that, which would lead you to a master's degree, an NCOMP. We also have a very, very popular computer science and, and artificial intelligence degree program. And if you just look in the media, you will see how hot a topic artificial intelligence has become over recent years. And there's a huge demand out there for people who have skills in artificial intelligence for everything from the, the new world of self-driving vehicles that we want to have to the huge kind of impact that artificial intelligence is beginning to have in our study of medical science and so on and so forth. And that's a very, very popular degree program. We also have another very, very popular program here, our Computing for Business and Management. This is actually a, a joint program that we have with our School of Business over here, where you can study computing, but you can also study various business uh, and management topics uh, as well. And that's proving to be very attractive for people who see that they have a career uh, in applying computing ideas across the sort of business and management world, people who are interested in getting to find into financial technology and stuff like that, that's proving very popular. We also have our computing for digital media, which places uh, emphasis on things like graphics. And we also have a games and multimedia environment program. And what we also have is our foundation year program. So if you feel you're not quite ready for the straight entry into our traditional degree programs, we also have an additional year, we call that year zero or our foundation year, which has a lower tariff entry point and you can add an additional year. And what that does is it builds on your basic skills and prepares you for entry into our core degree programs. And we also have a new BSc program, again, joint with our business school on finance and technology. So those are all some of the just exciting degree programs that we actually have. Um, now, <clears throat> what you can also do as well, depending on how you want to uh, engage with your studies, is that all of our programs also have available them an optional industrial placement year. And that typically comes between year two and the final year three in the BSc program or between years two and four, if you decide to go with our master's program, the MCOMP. And the idea is there that after your second year, you take your skills and you can go out and you can work in industry under the joint supervision of the university and an industrial partner. And that's really, really nice because you can earn some money and you can gain some valuable experience. Um, the real value of this, well, there's two really important values uh, that you can add by doing an optional industrial placement year. Uh, first of all, obviously, you're building your uh, skills and experience. Um, but really, the big advantage of that, as well as earning a bit of money, is it means that when you complete your studies here at the university, you already have some industrial experience to add to your personal CV. And many students find that that places them at an advantage in a competitive jobs market when they're trying to secure their first professional position. But it is an optional thing. Some students opt to do it and some decide just to go straight through with their studies. And they are both very, very viable routes. Uh, there's a note down here that all of our degree programs are accredited by the British Computer Society, BCS. Uh, that's really just a mark that the kind of work that we do here and the courses and the learning that we have here is recognized by the professional society, the British Computing Society, as being of a kind of quality which is appropriate for an IT or a computer science professional. So BCS accreditation for all of our degree programs. Okay, so what we've got is a lovely modern campus where you can come and study. And we have a variety of different interesting and challenging degree programs uh, that you can have a look at. I'll just deal with a couple of questions here. I'll just deal with them as I'm going along because I can see some questions coming up in the chat feed. So Siaza 
It says, your question is, what is your favorite part of teaching computer science? Hmm, that's a really interesting question. A favorite part of teaching computer science. I think one of the most interesting things with teaching computer science is when students are able to work together to solve some kind of team projects. I'll give you an example of what I mean. One of the courses that I teach with our second year students um, is a software engineering module. And that involves having teams of young people working together, typically somewhere between four and six young people working together. And what they have to do is they have to work together to build a particular application. And the application I got them to build last year was I got them to build an electronic version of the popular board game Monopoly. And what's really exciting about that is that they actually have to work together. And part of the reason why we have this module is it's about learning how to work together. And that can be a really rewarding experience because what I have to try and do is help them understand how to work together. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it can be really challenging. But what's really nice is when we get to the end of that, all of our teams are then able to demonstrate the work that they have done. And what they find is that what they are able to achieve together is much more than what they would be able to achieve individually. So a lot of that is about using your skills, about using your skills, your ability to program, your ability to communicate, and to use those to work together. Because at the end of the day, if you go to work in a professional company, you will work as part of a team. So learning to work as part of a team to solve a problem together is a really interesting thing because most of our students will not have had any experience of doing that before. And it's a really challenging and a really fun thing to do. And a lot of our students find that that's a really rewarding experience. Another question here, if you have not studied computer science for A-levels, can we still study a computer science course in university? Absolutely you can is the answer. And we have many students who have not studied computer science at A-level. Our courses are designed such that as long as you have the necessary academic skills, then you will find you will be just fine. I will say that it's very, very useful to have a good maths qualification, okay, as it would be the case for any numerate discipline like computer science or engineering. So I would suggest maths is useful, but not all of our students have maths at A-level, but I would say that a maths at A-level is useful. But we have many students who come in with A-levels in history and English and technology and lots of different kinds of things, and they have all gone on to be successful. Uh, another question is asked you, what A-levels would you recommend for a computer science degree? The answer is, I don't think there's one single answer to that question. It depends on the person themselves. We teach people to program and we have maths programs going on here. So if you don't have those skills at A-level, you will gain those skills whilst you are here at the university. So the truth is there are lots of different kinds of A-levels that would suit. Um, obviously some can be more useful than others. If you're going on to study computer science with business, you might find it's useful to have a business A-level. I would say that it is helpful, but not essential to have an A-level in maths. Okay, but other than that, I'd say that there's actually a lot of different types of students who come to us and they all are able to be successful. I just want to spend a little bit of time telling you about some of the themes that we have on our courses. So, for example, we have modules on program. You will learn to program. It is a cornerstone, important part of studying computer science. You will learn to program. Okay. The languages we use, we use a wide range of languages, but probably the two languages you'll see most of here at the university are Java and Python, two modern languages. Um, if you study robotics, you might also come across languages like C and C++ as well. But everybody here, no matter what program they do, learning to program is an important part of the computer science journey. It's an important part of the skill set that you need. You'll also learn about the foundations of coding. We, we, we call this kind of like the science, the kind of essential things that you have to know in order to be good at science. And give you some examples of why that might be important. Here is a very simple looking book here. It's called The Making of a Fly. And you might think to yourself, what is so important about the book, The Making of a Fly? Well, it turns out that The Making of a Fly but at some point in the past, this rather ordinary looking book 
here, this rather ordinary looking book, turned out to be the subject of a little bit of a controversy. So this book, The Making of a Fly, shouldn't cost that much, but then suddenly started turning up on sites like Amazon. Well, <clears throat> they wanted $23 million for it. And that's a little bit steep for a book that normally sells for $100. What's really going on? Well, how on earth is this possible? Well, what actually happened in this particular case is all to do with computer science basics. Because the idea is automated pricing algorithms are behind it. Now, automated pricing algorithms are the kinds of things that are used to deal with the idea that when something is in demand, it should push the price up. Um, a lot of online sellings do exactly this, automated pricing algorithms. We need to be careful about these ideas because sometimes these things can cause tremendous problems. Now, in the case of our making of a fly book, what it meant was that on one particular day, people were finding that a particular book suddenly now seemed to cost $23 million. And you might think that's a bit funny. And it kind of was, because clearly nobody's going to buy a book for $23 million. It's just a fault in our automated pricing. It means that people haven't understood it. But sometimes the impact can be much greater, like what happened on May the 6th, at 2.45 on the New York Stock Exchange, where automated trading algorithms went absolutely out of control and caused a flash crash. Now, that's important because in this particular case, it's not just a book with a crazy price. This is now affecting finances in a global sense. And it's all because automated trading algorithms have not been developed and tested properly. Maybe what they should have done it's got some people who really understood these kinds of computer science basics. Just having a look at the uh, question feed here, what A-levels would you recommend for a computer science degree in university? As I said, there are lots of different kinds of A-levels. I mean, for example, the A-levels that I studied many years ago were maths, physics, and chemistry. I don't think I've ever used any chemistry skills here at the university, but I've certainly used a lot of my math skills. But some of my students come, they have got things like maths, history, and English. Other students have got qualifications in philosophy. There's a wide variety of different kind of A-levels. Okay, but as I said, I do think it can be helpful, although it is not essential to have an A-level in maths. But there are a wide range of different kinds of students who come to us. So... Computer foundations, the science, understanding how things like automated trading algorithms work and what the perils and the dangers of them are. Other themes that we have, software engineering. Because not only do we want to learn to program, but we want to be able to learn to program well, to build software that's highly reliable that people will want to use. And that's important because sometimes the software that we're building, we'll, we may come to rely on it. You might think it's okay, if your smartphone isn't very reliable or crashes, or if your TikTok program suddenly stops working properly, that may be a, a minor irritation. But if that software, well, if that software is doing something important like controlling machines in a hospital or controlling aircraft, then suddenly it's really important. Software engineering is all about how do we program or create programs which are really reliable, that will really do what we want. We also have uh, themes on computer systems, understanding the, the parts of a processing system, all the different parts of a computer system, how they interact, the difference between the hardware systems and the software systems, and so on and so forth. We also have themes on professional issues. This is really related to the idea of uh, professional standards and ethics and how we form uh, a part of an effective part of a, a business or a professional community because as well as being good at computer science, we also have to remember that we need to be good at being parts of teams. We also have modules on web computing for people who are interested in online world and developing applications for online use. We also have courses in management, and that's particularly important, obviously, if you're doing one of our programs like uh, computer science with business management. We also have modules on intelligent systems. This forms really part of our uh, computer science with artificial intelligence. So intelligent systems 
is another very, very popular course theme that we have. And this is really about making systems which are smart. And what do I mean by smart? Well, I guess that depends. Um, but kind of systems that we might think of as smart, well, think of some of the systems that are around you and that you use all the time. Systems like Siri and Cortana and Alexa, they're intelligent systems. They have to recognize a voice. They have to pick out the words. They then have to figure out what it is that you're saying, and they then have to make the right kind of response. That's one kind of an example of an intelligent system. Another example of an intelligent system might be the kind of software system behind something like a Tesla, the autopilot system on a Tesla that has to recognize a roadway and has to guide a vehicle safely down a road and take you to a destination. And this is a technology which will have a real impact over the next 10 and 20 years as the world starts to move towards these kind of autonomous vehicle systems. And um, we can also think about intelligent systems, well, in terms of things like game playing as well. We can talk about the idea of machine learning, getting machines to learn how to do things. Because as well as programming machines, as well as sitting there and typing the code and telling a machine what to do, we can also allow machines to learn how to do something. We can get them to learn, to recognize patterns, and to understand how to carry out activities. Machine learning yeah, it's a kind of a system where you can try something out and it can improve the way that it performs over time. Uh, one good example here is getting machines to learn how to play games like, for example, the game Go, one of the most complex games to play. Well, let's decide to put a good Go player against a machine. So what we've got here is we have Lee Sedol here who's playing Go, and on the other side, we have a machine, AlphaGo. And in this particular contest, I'm afraid it's 4-1 to AlphaGo. Lee won one time, and the AlphaGo program won four times. It's not perfect because Lee can still beat the machine, but AlphaGo is doing a pretty good job. But in fact, what the program has done is it's actually learned how to play Go. And the way it's done that is by learning by playing against itself. So rather than somebody just writing a really incredible program to play Go, what they've done is they've created a program that can learn. And then they've just allowed that program to learn how to play Go really well by allowing it to play against itself and working out where the good moves are and where the less good moves are. And that's an example of machine learning at work. And machine learning is becoming an increasing part of what the modern computer science and informatics story is all about because sometimes problems are really complicated. So we just have to let machines learn how to solve them. That's incredibly important in things like medical applications where we can learn how to recognize, for example, cancer cells from non-cancer cells. Now these are incredibly important ideas and that forms a really important part of the modern story of artificial intelligence. We also have as a theme robotics and adaptive systems. So if you're interested in getting into robotics, we have um, courses and modules on that as well. And you can get to play around with all sorts of different kinds of robots. And sometimes they fall over and do all sorts of crazy things. And we also have modules on graphics for people who are really interested in getting into digital media and animated graphics. Perhaps they see themselves getting into computer graphics and CGI kind of technology, uh, we have modules uh, all about that. And we also have options for looking at how computer science works and contributes to the world of music and audio as well. So lots of different kinds of modules. And I've got a couple of slides here just to show how these are plugged into our various degree programs. So for example, if you study our straight computer science program, you would take these modules. Everybody needs to learn how to program, but you'd also have all of these modules as well. This would be like the kind of blend or the mix that you would take a part of. If on the other hand, you decided to go for computer science and artificial intelligence, then you would find modules like intelligent systems and all of this kind of stuff starts to have an impact. Still, everybody's learning to program. Everybody's dealing with all of the foundations. If on the other hand, you decide that computing for business and management is few, then obviously we bring in some of our management modules as well. And management and professional issues now become a really important part of what the computing for business and management program is all about. 
So lots of different kinds of flavors. So the idea is that your first year here at Sussex, well, the first year is the same for all of the programs. You don't have to choose immediately. Do I want to be in business or do I want to be in digital media or whatever? Because actually the first year is common to all of our computer science degrees. So the first year is the same. And that allows students to learn all the basic kind of skills that they need. And then during their first year, they make their choice as to which one of their programs they want to go out into. So the first year provides all of our necessary foundations. And then that allows people to switch between the different degrees. So maybe you start off by thinking that artificial intelligence is gonna be for you. And then you do your first year and maybe you decide that actually computing for business and management looks more interesting. You can do that because the first year is the same for all of the programs. The specialisms will be introduced in the second and final years. Also, very importantly, during the final year, you also undertake a substantial final year project. This is where you get to investigate or do a little bit of research into a topic. And there's lots of different kinds of topics that our students get into. Some people like to do programming projects. Some people like to do robotics projects. Some people like to do music tech projects, graphics projects. There's a huge range of different things that people do. I've got here just a, a nice little example that we can see. Here's one that one of our previous students has done. Hopefully this is going to work okay. It's a kind of a part game application, part AI application. It's a kind of a simulation of what we call artificial life. So what we have here is we have this little organism in the middle and he's trying to work around this space and he's trying to interact with this space. It's trying to survive. So what it's doing is it's moving around the space. It's responding to all of the other artificial organisms in the space. And it's just trying to survive. And what it's trying to do is to develop rules which will help it interact with the other artificial life forms. And which it's trying to learn how to survive in its own environment. So it's a kind of part graphics, part artificial intelligence kind of application. It was a very successful project. So what can you expect to do here? Uh, question from uh, Sia, so do we learn about Arduino in university? The answer to that is yes. Arduinos are used, for example, on our robotics courses. So if you're interested in getting into robotics, you'll find lots of our students working way with Arduino systems, uh, using that to control motors or arms and wheels on robots. So if you're interested in Arduinos and robotics, the answer is yes, you can learn about that on our robotics modules. Oh, but you've asked the question, is there a huge difference in the pure computing degree and the module and the computing and AI degree in terms of modules? You can actually find that just by looking at the diagram. So for example, here's our straight computer science program there. And there's our computer science with artificial intelligence. And you can see, let's have a see what the differences are between them. You can just kind of flick backwards and forwards and you can see those differences. Um, yes, there are some differences. Uh, does robotics include 3D printing? Yes, it does. We have some extensive 3D printing facilities here. And many of our robotic students make components for their own robots and they make those using our modern 3D printing suites. And that's certainly something that you can do. We also use Lego robots as well. Uh, Kin Wan, you're asking, do we learn quantum computing? The answer is in our undergraduate programs at the moment, the answer to that question is no. However, we do have uh, one of the UK's most advanced quantum research centers actually here at the university, um, run by Professor Winifred Heisinger, who is well known internationally as being a leading expert in quantum computers. And we have a number of quantum computers here. Our engineering department built them here at the university. But at the moment, the quantum computers are very much for the research community. So if you're interested in doing research after you've finished your undergraduate program and you want to get into quantum computers, we have a quantum computing group here at the university. <clears throat> and if you're interested, I can provide you with a link where you can find out more about what our quantum computing group are doing. Uh, does the course cover issues like cybersecurity, data privacy and ethics? Great question. Yes, that would be in our professional issues topic where we talk about issues like that. And we do actually have some modules in cybersecurity as well, which are available, I think, at the moment as third year options. So, yes, we do talk about those topics. Those are great questions, guys. Thank you. So what can you expect here? Well, 
we're interested in making software. This is a computer science degree. We're not just going to sit here and use software. We want to learn how to make software. We want to understand what software is really all about. So you'll find here that what we're really interested in is finding out how to make things, how to make things work. OK, so that's why I stress the importance of being good at programming. We're interested in making stuff. We're interested in making cool and exciting software that solves interesting problems. We're interested in being able to control robots or control vehicles or do data analysis, lots of different things. We have a very friendly and approachable faculty, people like me who you'll find teaching you. And we have, generally speaking, a bright and motivated student base. For example, we would expect most of our students to have an A level, typically AAB or maybe ABB. If they've come from other routes, uh, this is the BTEC route. That would be distinction, 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 and distinction, distinction, merit. Uh, you must really have at least a B grade GCSE maths. Uh, we also have additional maths modules. So we will teach or we do teach the additional mathematics that you need in order to be successful. But I personally, I do find that it is helpful, it's a little bit advantageous if you have studied maths at a level. Ken, I will make sure I send you over that link for our quantum computing team. I'll have to go and find it, but I will send that over uh, via your team in Malaysia, uh, hopefully later on today. So we've got lots of really exciting and well-motivated faculty, good at their jobs, and we've got good quality students. Our teaching is organized in two 11 week teaching terms or semesters, and there's assessments after each term. So you have our first term, and then you have some assessment or examination block, and then you have another semester of teaching, and then you have another examination block. So it's a two semester per year program. A typical week, well, any typical week, a student is studying four modules at a time with different amounts of hours of lectures and lab classes as well. So for example, at the moment, I'm teaching a course or one of my modules, and that's got four hours of lectures plus another one hour of lab classes. It varies from module to module, but typically you'd be taking four modules at a time. We also have excellent student support here as well. Uh, very innovative. All of our lectures are recorded. And so if you need to go through a lecture again, we have a, a very nice lecture capture system. And you can go back and review. We also have uh, individual advisors, academic advisors. Every student is assigned uh, an academic advisor who they can turn to for help and encouragement. And we also have students helping other students as well, something which we call peer assisted learning. So these are optional classes that you go to where other students who've been through these modules will be able to provide you with help and advice and support. And that's particularly useful Oh, thank you very much. The Sussex Centre for Quantum Technologies. Thank you very much. That saved me getting the link. There you are, guys. You can go and find out about our crazy quantum computer. It is a crazy looking device as well. So there's lots of support available here for the university. You are not on your own. You obviously have your other students. You have our teaching assistants. You have the faculty staff. You have peer assisted learning you have academic advisors, there's lots of support. And we also have a student life center who can help you when things get a little bit difficult. We take the well-being and the support of our students uh, really, really, in, uh, it's a very important part of what we do. And our graduates are highly employable. For example, there you can see in 2016, over 94% of our graduates were in employment six months after graduation. I don't have the latest figures on those, because obviously the COVID situation at the moment is making it a little bit difficult to get really good and reliable figures at the moment. But as you can see, it's a very, very high percentage of our graduates go on to be either in employment or in further study six months after graduation. That's really, really good. Got very, very high employment rates for our graduates. There's a healthy demand here in the UK and uh, in the wider a global situation for good quality computer science graduates. And our computer science graduates go on to do lots of different things. Here's just some of the things they go on to do. It's a huge variety of different kinds of jobs. Some of them decide they really want to be programmers and they decide they want to be really good at that. Some go on to be IT managers, consultants, mobile app engineers, project managers. There's a huge range of different kinds of exciting and interesting career opportunities that our students go on to do. 
As I said earlier, we also have industrial placements. You can opt between year two and year three to have a year working in industry, fully supported both by our company and with our tutors here at the university. Of course, that's really, really nice because that also gains you some salary and some vital experience, and that helps enhance your degree opportunities. It helps enhance the kind of professional opportunities that you'll be able to get. Here are just some of the examples of places where people have gone on to have industrial places. Some of these are very large companies like HP and IBM, and here in the UK, BAE Systems, and some of them are much smaller, it's kind of uh, small consultancies or small development companies. There's local and global companies offering placements for Sussex students. So let's maybe see if we can wrap this up and get some questions. Why Sussex? Well, I'm biased because I work here and I think it's a really good university. We are quite a research intensive university, but that means that that research often finds its way into our teaching. We describe our teaching as being research led or research driven. OK, computing skills are widely sought by employers. There are many, many high quality opportunities for graduates from this university with degrees in computer science. But it's also fair to say that it's a beautiful campus itself. It's a beautiful and relaxed campus sitting in the hills, the South Downs on the south coast of the UK and very near the very modern and cosmopolitan city of Brighton that you can see over here. So it's a beautiful and relaxed campus. There are lots of things to do in the area. We have high quality facilities. We have very high quality support for the learning and educational experience. And Brighton itself is an exciting place for young people to be. It's a young city. It's got a large number of small digital startup companies. And there are lots of interesting opportunities to be had as well. Right, I'm conscious that time is ticking on. Thank just you, King. Also See, that was just say that was a fantastic presentation. Yeah, and, and did you did really did your own job brilliantly, and you've also done my job brilliantly as well. You presented yourself and answered all your own questions. So obviously we did have a lot of questions in the chat going forward, and you've obviously covered lots of those. If people have any more questions, uh, feel free to add them in. Um, I think the ones that you're asking are great because obviously the ones about requirements and stuff are things that I, you know, a self here can help you with. I can't tell you about quantum computing. So you've got a real expert here in his field. If you have any of those questions, as nerdy as you like, you've got someone that's going to be able to talk to you and answer those questions now. So those real technical things that you want to know, you're unsure about, and things you want to learn, now's the chance. This is a real great opportunity to ask someone. And I have a few questions as well, Kingsley, going forward. Um, just to say as well, on just on entry requirements in general, it is worth thinking, obviously different universities take different uh, approaches and um, a lot of universities in the uk will demand mathematics some at the higher end particularly places like cambridge will demand further maths as well so obviously um, sussex have an approach that's great really open really liberal um, and you can see that with their broad first year the way they're approaching that's fantastic some institutions will demand the mathematics so obviously when you're looking at five uh, institutions on a ucas form do be aware that some may insist on the math um, when you're making that application. So I just thought I'd make that clear to everyone as well. And as Kingsley's already said, it is obviously very useful. Um, and it is the kind of key academic subject uh, on the course that he runs too. So, and we um, do have maths program, maths modules here as well. So don't think you're just going to escape the maths. What we do is we have our own maths modules, which we then do to make sure that everybody has the necessary mathematical skills in order to really succeed in their studies here at the university. Okay, King, so I'd actually like to follow up just on one other thing. It obviously comes up a lot on, on all of our chats, really. It's about the work placement. Um, hmm. And I, again, we had, we've obviously I've been sitting on these for the last few weeks now with people from various universities and departments. And um, we had someone from the psychology department at Bath. Really, the way he described the difference in the students that took the year work placement and those that didn't. So normally it's done between the second and, and third year. Uh, is, generally yes. speaking, he said teaching the students in the third year who had been on the work placement and those that hadn't, he was teaching two very different sets of students. Is, is that something you find too? 
you find that it is really quite a, quite a changing thing for those people to do it? I think it certainly can be. I mean, I see this from both sides because um, I have worked in companies as well where I have been the industrial supervisor on the other side as well as being a member of the faculty here at the university. Uh, and from my university point of view, yes, I do see the difference. Those people who do an industrial placement, I often find that by year three, their confidence is much increased. Their idea about how to work in a team, their idea about how to manage their time, their idea about the sort of professional responsibility that they're prepared to take is often enhanced. They've learned something really, really useful. I think it also depends on what kind of company you go to work for. Some students will go and work for quite a small company which has got a very technical focus, very, very technical focus. And what they come back with is enhanced skills. On the other hand, if you go and work for, say, a big institutional employer, say IBM, you'll get technical skills for sure. But what you'll also get is ideas about management, about what it is to be part of a bigger professional team. So I think the experience can vary a little bit depending on what kind of company. But I definitely do see a difference. I see students who have enhanced personal skills. They're much more personally confident. Um, they just feel better about themselves and they think they become much more relaxed about the idea of what kind of job or career they might want to have as well, because they've started to have a little bit of experience uh, to help them understand what that career they really want really looks like. So I think generally it's only ever a positive experience. I, I have never had a situation where a student has come back from an industrial placement having had a negative experience. So I, I think it's a very valuable thing, but I also recognize it's not for everybody because obviously it's an additional year of, of study. I can see there's a question here. Yeah. What was it? Uh, what was it about? It's two about programming, both, both about one about whether how useful programming languages would be prior to applying. And I think then mm. how much of it of the course itself at Sussex is a practical uh, yeah, applied okay. no, program and how much of it is theoretical. So. Okay, great questions. In terms of are you expected to know any programming languages? You don't have to, no. Um, for our first year, for example, we go straight in teaching Java, assuming that people don't know anything about programming. OK, um, if you go in via the foundation, learn, also the same thing, but you'd learn some C coding, a C and C++. And we wouldn't assume that anybody knew anything. However, we also many students do come to the university knowing something about programming, and that is helpful. I think it's a question of it's helpful but it's not essential. It depends. Different students have come from very different kinds of backgrounds. If you've got a student who's very personally interested in coding, they probably already know something about coding. But I also think that if you're trying to learn coding for yourself, it's very hard. Um, if you're going to try and, I, many students tell me this, they say they've tried to learn some coding for themselves and they've got a certain way, but then they kind of hit a wall and they're not quite, and that's when coming to a university and really having the, the full benefit of being able to learn in a university environment is a really, really helpful thing. I would say that probably about half of our students coming to the university have some previous experience of programming, whether it's JavaScript or Python or something like that, and that's useful. But equally, we have come to use students who come and they maybe they've done maths and physics. They haven't done any programming and they do just fine. They learn programming from the ground upwards from year one. Uh, Ash has asked, how much is practical program? How much is theory? Uh, in year one, it's more about learning to code. As you go and progress further on, for example, get towards from our second and third year topics, you start looking at some of the more theoretic issues. Um, so, for example, you'd look there at sort of the different types of programming language. We call it comparative programming, where you look in, you get into functional programming and non-functional programming, the different kinds of programming. There's some really quite theoretic stuff. And also, for example, one of the second year modules I teach, when we actually look at how to analyze programs mathematically to work out how complex they are, how long they will take to run. So I would say that year one is kind of more practical. You learn to code. And then the sort of more specialist modules in year two and year three start to look at some of the sort of analysis kind of issues and start getting into some of the more theoretic kind of issues. Can I just um, ask you, uh, so this, is, this is something that's come up when we've spoken to computer science lecturers before. I think maybe one of your colleagues at Durham in the past said something. In terms of the, in terms of the kind of practical con content of the course, in terms of mm -hmm. some of these skills you're learning in terms of computer programming, et cetera, he, mm -hmm. he sort of indicated that perhaps a lot of those skills, by the time students actually reach the workforce, 
would actually be out of date and need redoing anyway. And that what was key about um, the computer science course was the transferable skills and the, the logic behind a lot of what you were doing. Oh, would absolutely. you say that's accurate or is that? I, I would say it's accurate. I mean, I'll give you an example which perhaps help to understand. Um, a student might come to a university such as this and would learn to program. Let's say they learn to program in a language like Java. And then they go to a job and they say, well, actually, I don't need Java. I need to be able to learn to program in, in C sharp. And a lot of students go, oh, well, that, will that be difficult? But what a lot of students realize is that once you've learned one of the programming languages, it's actually very easy to adapt and translate those skills to another programming language. And companies know this. I'll give you a great example. Lots of companies here will say we need C++ programmers, will hire Java programmers because they know that it's very easy to transfer those skills from working in a language like Java to C++. They know it's an easy thing to do. What they're looking for is evidence of good programming skills. So as you, once you have good programming skills, they're not tied to one language. It's a highly transferable skill. And there are lots of such transferable skills. Um, and lots of companies are looking not so much for individual technologies, they're looking for a person with a set of transferable skills who they can then put in a professional situation. So they're really looking for a person with a set of transferable skills and exactly which language or anything like that they've learned actually is not quite as important. So those transferable skills are very, very important in a computer science setting. Excellent. Um, again, mate, here's, here's a few from uh, quite broad questions, maybe just as we come to the end. Um, perhaps looking forward, obviously, as someone in your field, you're constantly looking to the future. I mean, are, are there things about the future in, in terms of technology that you're very positive about? And indeed, are there things that you have more concerns about? So, more broadly <laughs> now? Um, well, obviously, it, it, this, is, this is the layman worrying about robots taking over the world here. This well, I, I, absolutely. I mean, we've only got to watch films like Terminator and stuff like that <laughs> to see the dangers of artificial intelligence. Um, I don't think we're in too much danger of the world being overrun by psychotic robots or anything like that, but I do think there are challenges. I'll give you an example. Um, it is foreseeable that in the next 20, 10 to 20 years that autonomous or self-driving vehicles will start to play a very significant role in the economies of the world. We will be driving as individuals much less. We will be relying on machines to drive us to the shops, to take us to our workplaces, and so on and so forth. And that's fine. But the computer science part of that, the actual self-driving, is only one part. The other part of this, and the word has come up in some of our questions, is ethics. Because then we have to consider, as a society, what will we do when these technologies don't work properly? At the moment, if two cars collide, then we can get the two drivers into a court of law and we can figure out who is responsible for the accident. And we understand as individuals what this means. We understand our role and our responsibilities and our place in that society. But in the future, if there's an accident between two self-driving cars, now we're gonna have two software companies battling it out in court trying to work out whose artificial intelligence system was responsible for it. Well, that's a very, very different kind of way of looking at the world. It brings in all sorts of interesting problems like ethics. How should we design and program these machines? Remember, these machines will be making decisions on our behalf, and we need to understand what those decisions will be. And I suspect, as with all technologies, what we will find is that the law will struggle to keep up with the technology. And we see that already with the world of social media, where the world of technology can move far faster than the legal frameworks that surround it. And we've seen that most recently in things like the, the uh, presidential election in the United States, where technology roars out of control. <laughs> and then we see some of the kind of strange impact and influences that it can have across the world. Uh, we see a question here, is there a specific course that has a focus on ethics? Yes, we do because it's an important part of how we see the world of computer science developing. We have a module, it's got a rather strange name, it's called the ghost in the machine, and it considers issues like ethics and how they apply to our modern world of computer science and artificial intelligence, because it's gonna become increasingly important. We want to know that the decisions that machines are making on our behalf are the right ones that we feel that we are in control of the outcomes of these processes. And that's particularly important when you've got devices which have learned how to do things and when it's quite difficult to find out how they actually work. Now, these are exciting kinds of issues because what we can see is a world where we can see an improvement 
I mean, if I have the idea that my car will drive me to work and will drive me to the supermarket and will drive me to see my friends, I welcome this world as long as I feel that I'm in control of it. There are other aspects like quantum computing and if, when they become a reality, they will change the world greatly. They will change the world in the lifetime of your students. Probably not so much in my life, but in their lifetime, it will have a huge impact on the world that we have. Um, so there are lots of interesting things and robotics again, changes that the world of robotics is bringing to. Now these are really exciting sort of important challenges and the world will need increasingly computer scientists, high quality computer scientists to help be a part of building that future. And not only building that future, but make sure that that's the future that we want to have. And I think those are some of the important and exciting challenges that face us. Well, that is an incredibly thorough response to that question. So thank you, King. That's absolutely fantastic. It's been a brilliant talk today. I think I think really detailed. I've, I've, I've come away learning a lot. I've got whole new terms I can use now. It's brilliant. So you'll get, your words will be recycled to others through me. I don't worry well, about I'm that. I'm grateful for it. Do you wish to have a copy of the presentation that I've used today, which you want to make well, available to students? We've recorded it. We've recorded this whole session. So we'll, we'll have right. this available for students to, to view, as always, on our website. So thank you very much for that. But we've come to the end of it now. And um, again, obviously, as you know, we'll have Kingsley's details made available. If people have any questions for him, you can ask him. Uh, you can also follow up with Lillian, who we have here. If you have any questions about Sussex and the entry requirements there. But I just want to say thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much to Kingsley. And good evening, everyone. If you'd like to leave the Zoom session now, thank you very much. Good evening to you all.